Thank you very much uh, for the introductions and to, to uh, the Asia Society and the Hirschman Center for hosting this event and also for, to James Crabtree uh, for joining us tonight to discuss uh, India's 17th general election um, since it's gained independence in 1947. Before we jump into the conversation, I just want to, for those of you who may not have followed the election, um, give a little bit of background on it and, and on its results. Um, so this, as you may have seen in uh, newspaper headlines around the world, uh, gained renown and always gains renown for being the world's largest um, election, this time with 900 million eligible voters. Um, because of the scale of the election, Voting was held in seven phases from April 11th to the 19th of May uh, in all of India's 29 states and seven union territories. Um, and voting, there's a number of elections wrapped up in this election, but uh, the voting took place uh, and what has obviously gained most attention is the election for India's lower house, the Lok Sabha, um, although there are also state assembly elections in six states. Um, voter turnout was, was high at 67%, and this turnout kind of in the perspective of world democracies is actually much higher uh, than many, um, many of the world's democracies. It's also worth noting, and I think thinking about in this context, uh, that 67 or 66% of these 900 million voters live in rural areas. Um, and for the first time in India's history, uh, voter turnout was about equal among women and men. Um, although in the beginning um, of the election cycle, issues of unemployment and agrarian distress seemed to promise to become important electoral issues, following a terrorist attack in Jammu Kashmir on Indian security forces and uh, in the wake of uh, India's airstrikes in Pakistan in late February 2019. Um, the BJP, I think, quite effectively mobilized the electorate around issues of national security um, and around, indeed, Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister himself. So, in a sense, with the 2019 election, the BJP has defied the expectations of many. Um, by strengthening their parliamentary majority uh, and winning 303 seats. And in doing this, they've also substantially extended uh, their reach in eastern, northeastern, and southern India. So together with the, the uh, National Democratic Alliance, which, uh, they, of which they are the coalition leader, uh, they now control 350 of the 543 seats in the Lok Sabha. Um, by contrast, the Indian National Congress, together with its coalition allies in the United Progressive Alliance, together hold fewer than 100 seats. So there is a stark kind of discrepancy here between government and opposition. There's also a number of questions, I think, that arise with this election. Among them are questions about the kind of nation that India is and is becoming. Um, and about the implications of the electoral outcome for diverse and complex forms of inequality that one finds in India. And so after the 2019 election, a question I think on many minds uh, is whether Indian democracy is in transition. And if the answer to this question is yes, then how do we understand the dynamics uh, of this transition and what are the stakes in it? So in some sense, this is the aim um, of the conversation tonight, and I want to begin with a question to James um, about the election itself. Uh, so the results really came as a surprise to many. Many people were not expecting the BJP to do as well as it did. And I'm curious to hear, also as you were in India during the elections, traveling through, uh, through India, how you, how you interpret the results of the election and what, what you find striking about it. 
Okay, very good. It's a great question to start. Thank you very much all for coming. Um, I pr particularly appreciate those of you here at the Graduate Institute because I was told it's the last week of term and everyone's panicking about essays. So anyone who's come despite being in the middle of an essay crisis or an exam crisis is much appreciated. Um, it's particularly intimidating talking at an organization associated with Mr. Hirschman given the, the supposition that anyone at any moment might use their voice of uh, their choice of exit and disappear. But the fact you've all bunched in the center suggests that only the people here might be thinking about leaving halfway through. So this at least is, a, I'm not sure you, sir, are an, obviously an idiosyncrat sitting over on the extremes. But uh, um, So yeah, I, I lived in India for five years as a foreign correspondent. I lived in Mumbai. I was the Mumbai bureau chief for the Financial Times, then moved to Singapore. I wrote a book about India, which came out last year. Um, and so I sort of continue to have an interest in Indian affairs. And so I went with a group of journalists and policy analysts um, during the middle part of the campaign, started out in West Bengal, which in Calcutta and, and area around there, which was one of the, the main swing states that, that people were talking about, and then uh, went throughout Uttar Pradesh, the, the largest, most populous, well, the most populous state in India and the, the kind of the main battleground in any election, starting in the capital Lucknow and traveling through to Varanasi um, in the end. And so this group that I was with, um, which included some reasonably well-known Indian journalists, when we got to the end in Varanasi, uh, we, we sort of had a poll um, in which everybody you know, said, this is what we think is going to happen. Here's our best guess. And so the, the poll of polls, the wisdom of the crowd, was that the BJP were going to win 215 seats. So miles wrong, uh, given the BJP won 303. Is that right? I can't even remember what it was. Um, and so the conventional wisdom of what was going to happen in this election was way off the pace. And so it, it sort of invites a kind of question as to what did everybody get wrong? What happened here that people didn't see? Um, the supposition before the election, as, as many of you would know, was that Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister, although he was reasonably popular personally, was going to struggle because he hadn't delivered employment of the sort that India's young population wanted. You mentioned the fact that India's rural areas, many of them have been struggling. Uh, there was an issue of corruption. Modi was perceived to be a clean leader, um, but there had been a series of corruption scandals, one in particular um, about the purchase of fighter jets from France, uh, not Switzerland, thankfully. Um, and so the perception was that the combination of these things were going to make it very difficult for Modi to win, or at least win outright. But actually, he won just as impressively as he did last time. Um, and I think given how impressively they won, the answer sort of has to be all of the above, that, that there are many different factors to do with the, uh, a better funded campaign, the popularity of Modi personally, uh, the fact that the Congress opposition party remained disorganized and with unattractive leadership, and that was true for many of the other of India's splintered opposition. But you mentioned national security. I mean, as we traveled through Uttar Pradesh, the thing that voters who were either BJP supporters or, or kind of wavering for, for Modi, the thing that they would play back to you was this issue of national security, national strength, Modi and his strength as a leader. Some of the times that was to do with what had been happening with Pakistan, but sometimes it was just this kind of general sense that Modi was a strong leader who you could support. And, and so we got quite a sense of that on the ground. And I think that that is probably the fact that Modi managed to reframe this campaign, putting aside all of the mechanics, not as being about the economy, which is how he won in 2014, but as being about sort of the India's rise and Modi being the best steward of that. And that begins to give you a sense of of, of why he did as well, despite the fact that the, the economy wasn't as strong as perhaps he would have liked. So it seems then that, uh, in a sense, this was a contest between two leaders, Rahul Gandhi in the Congress and Modi um, as Prime Minister. Is yeah. that, well, I'm not, was that I'm not, your I'm sense? Not, I'm not sure it was in the end. I mean, in, in, in the end, it wasn't really a contest because one of them did really well and the other one did hopelessly badly. But I'm a journalist, and so the, there was a real palpable yearning amongst the, the journalistic community, despite in India is a kind of British-style parliamentary system, but, but the media desperately wants it to be a presidential election in which you can kind of compare one leader against another. And, and there was this, I think basically people completely overestimated the, the extent to which the Congress had renewed itself. There, there was a sense in the months leading up 
to the election that partly because Rahul Gandhi had been hammering Modi on corruption, that he'd found an issue that worked for him, there were these sort of little flashes that suggested the Congress was renewing itself institutionally. Uh, they had proposed a, a quasi-universal basic income, which kind of, that was an interesting idea that appeared like it might work well in India. As it turned out, it didn't work very well at all because they launched it very late and none of the people who it would have been affected by either believed it because the amount of money that they claimed to be offering was so preposterously large compared to, you know, if you're a poor farmer, the idea that you were being offered 72,000 rupees for free just seemed kind of completely unrealistic and nobody really believed it. And then most of these, the very poor people hadn't even heard of it, the, the, the surveys showed. Um, anyway, so there were all sorts of reasons why I think people overestimated the strength of the Congress party. And so there was this, there's this great temptation to portray Indian politics as a kind of battle between the two big parties. And in the end, that, you know, that didn't turn out to be a very useful guide to how the election was going to go. And the, the, the Congress party clearly has... Um, and we can probably talk more about this, that the sort of basic pitch of the Congress party, which is uh, identified with the country's secular, pluralistic heritage, is one that appears to have very little appeal to the vast majority of Indian voters anymore. Right, yeah, there's definitely something we can come back to. I'm curious also to know, though, so you were in India working as a Mumbai bureau chief for the Financial Times during the first couple of years of uh, uh, Modi's term in office from 2014. Um, and I'm given your work with the business community um, and among some of the elites that you describe uh, in Billionaire Raj, I'm wondering how you see different sections of the country and particularly perhaps those, um, those communities uh, whom you came to know how they responded to, to Modi and the BJP rule in the first term. Well, that's a good question. So I'll, I'll let you into a secret about being a foreign correspondent, particularly being a financial foreign correspondent. There's this sense that if you're a foreign correspondent, you, you turn up in a country and you sort of head out to try and find the kind of essential core of the country, head out to villages. But if you're a financial journalist, you don't do that at all. You, you sort of stay right in the center of the big cities and try and hang out with, with the elite and tempt them into indiscretions. And so I spent embarrassingly little time in, in kind of villages and urban slums and a lot of time in the offices of boring corporations trying to get them to tell me what companies they were going to buy and that kind of thing. But the, the advantage of being a foreign... So I now live in Singapore and the further east in Asia you go, the more difficult it becomes to be a foreign correspondent. In India, by contrast, you don't have to learn a prohibitively difficult foreign language, so it's very easy to get set up, at least if you're operating at that elite level. Um, but also it's, a, it's an open society, so it, it's sort of famous, it's a cliche that Indians like to talk. Um, uh, the Indians are very cosmopolitan in their outlook, and so much more so than China uh, are interested in what the kind of the Western media thinks about their companies and their institutions. And so I had phenomenally good access, not because of my charm and good looks, but because I sort of worked for a top-tier global newspaper. And so if you work for The Economist or The Wall Street Journal or The FT, you know, you can go and see pretty much whoever you like, whether that's a politician or a businessman. And that, in a sense, is how I ended up thinking, okay, maybe I could write a book about India. And the reason why there was a bit of sort of a pause there was because there's so many white English journalists who've written books about India that you think, God, oh, do I really need to add yet another one of these to the world's creaking bookshelves? But I, I, in a sense, not there hadn't been very many books written about, about corporate India. So you were asking me about the people I got to know. And I got to know the tycoon class, sort of corporate India. I was fascinated both by... Corruption, which is one theme of the book that I wrote, but and, and in a sense, how did that work? What was the mechanics, the trade craft of corruption? But also, India's tycoon class. So I don't really know if Switzerland has conglomerates. It probably does have a few, given you have a sort of family ownership, privately held business culture. But there aren't really, in the US or the UK, there aren't really tycoons anymore. You could point to Richard Branson or Elon Musk, maybe. But, but a country in which the large sections of the business community are dominated by by these sort of titans of industry more familiar from the American Gilded Age was something I found rather fascinating. What did these people think of Modi? I mean, I think most of them were reasonably well disposed towards Modi. I mean, they, they're, 
they, they saw the BJP as being business friendly. Um, there was an old business community in India that was associated with the Congress party that, that was suspicious of Modi given his Hindu nationalist background. But most of the newer business community was kind of reasonably well disposed towards the BJP and hoped that they would come in and introduce a whole range of pro-business reforms. They ended up being a little bit disappointed, I think, by what actually happened in practice. But in general, the business community in India is, is pretty, pretty favorably disposed towards the BJP, I think. Great. I want to turn now to kind of look a bit at the NDA policies, um, look back before we look forward, so look at the, some of the policies from the 2014 to 2019 period. Um, so over the last, last five years, uh, the NDA under the BJP introduced a number of fairly dramatic initiatives and reforms, um, among them as you probably know, demonetization in 2016, um, the introduction of a goods and services tax in 2017. Um, there have been a number of initiatives to tackle uh, unemployment um, and still other initiatives that are more welfare oriented, right? The extension of free LPG connections to poor households uh, and so on. But at the same time, as you've alluded to um, earlier, at the same time as there has been kind of dramatic uh, and uh, well-publicized initiatives, uh, there have, some of these claimed accomplishments or policies of the government uh, have been subject to question. So we now know unemployment is at a 45-year high. Um, there is a persistent agrarian crisis. Um, and there are concerns about normalization of violence particularly uh, along religious lines, but also caste-based and gender violence. Um, so kind of thinking about the, the five years of NDA majority government, what, do you, what would you see as its kind of signature initiatives, successful or, or not? Uh, what will... It's a, it's a big question. So when, when Modi was elected in, in 2014, he, I mean, I guess, in a sense, you shouldn't really understand Indian politics in the way that we think about European politics. So there's a tendency within European politics, you think about issues and a left-right spectrum, and actually often that's not the way that Indian politics is really best understood. You're better to start with the caste system and the way in which the kind of parties relate to that in various different ways. But anyway, putting that to one side, Modi won the, the sort of back-of-the-envelope reason was a mixture of economic opportunity, the fact that he appeared to promise a, a kind of... Tech, technocratically sensible program of economic reform, um, inflation, that, that he uh, uh, kind of caught public anger about runaway inflation, and then corruption was the, the sort of third of the three reasons that people would give for why his campaign was so popular. Um, that's quite in contrast to the campaign that he just ran. And so a lot of people judged his success on, on had he managed to deliver those three things. Um, and, and so on the first... I mean, his economic record is reasonably good. He had, you know, he delivered 7% economic growth on average over a five-year period, which in Switzerland would be fantastic and in Britain would be fantastic. In India, sort of okay, but, but actually that there were hopes that he would come in and introduce a whole range of far-reaching economic reforms that would boost India's growth up closer to what China managed during its boom years. And that, that didn't happen. Um, inflation has stayed reasonably low, and so that's a, that's a success. But on a whole range of other areas, there were, you know, the Indian economy is in that early stage of rapid industrialization and urbanization where it needs a kind of constant process of structural reform to get it up to the next stage. And so there were a whole range of other reforms that people hoped that he would bring in uh, that he either failed to do or didn't really try to do. So land and labor reform, banking reform, a, a bunch of other things that proved to be politically very difficult. And that was partly due to a kind of lack of political will and partly because in the end it's hard to get things done in the Indian political system. He has a majority in the lower house. He didn't have one in the upper house. So there were things that he might want to do that involve legislative change he just couldn't do, whether or not you would have wished him to do that. Um, so that was all reasonably good. And there, there was a sort of, for the first three years that he was in office... I think kind of fair-minded people would say, 
you know, the economic record is reasonably good. Maybe they should be going a bit faster, but they're not doing anything particularly disastrously wrong. And then in 2016 came this experiment in demonetization, which you may remember they, they scrapped all of the banknotes and there were huge queues outside ATM machines. And, and this was a kind of, I, I think now the... For a while, people would try and defend this until the evidence came. I mean, it was sort of self-evident from the start that this was a completely idiotic thing to do. It was one of the greatest kind of un unforced policy errors in modern history. Um, uh, and for a while, the BJP supporters tried to claim that this was some genius masterstroke that everyone else couldn't understand, either because it would help to battle corruption or because it would... I mean, there were all sorts of peculiar explanations. It would help to usher in an era of digital payments um, you know, in the, in the end, demonetization was, I mean, it knocked two or three basis points off growth for a couple of quarters, and that might not sound like anything much, but that's sort of Hurricane Katrina. Um, you know, that is like an unforced, huge natural disaster hitting your country. And I think that knocked a lot of people's faith in... Modi's economic management. Then there were a few other things that happened as well. They had rows with the central bank governor and a very competent central bank governor left. Then they lost another central bank governor. Um, and then there were sort of, the, the, the longer Modi's term went on, the more there appeared to be kind of unenforced errors and, and problems. And so at the end of this, um, I, I think his record was, was pretty mixed um, with the demonetization being a particular, a particular black mark. Now, in the end, again, the kind of conundrum was that didn't really seem to matter. In the end, the voters either didn't care about these issues or didn't know about them, or they decided that, you know, despite the fact that perhaps their own lives hadn't been materially transformed, that Modi had done just enough in terms of kind of welfare handouts of the sort that, that you mentioned. So as we journeyed around the rural villages in Uttar Pradesh, it was, you know, it was kind of noticeable that every village would have at least one new toilet and so that the kind of pr public provision of toilets was, that was a big thing. The government had built millions of toilets. They'd open, almost everyone in India now has a bank account that might not have any money in it, but um, but that was another thing that you mentioned, the, the provision of gas connections so you didn't have to go out and collect brushwood to, to cook on if you were in a, in a poor village. So the combination of there being just enough of these welfareist giveaways and then the fact that people liked Modi, they recognized him, they thought he was a strong leader, that, that kind of combination was enough to kind of continue uh, for different reasons the popularity that the BJP held uh, in 2014 this time around. And so... Keeping with um, questions around the economy and his economic, his record, unemployment is at just over 6% now. We, India also, as you know, has uh, half of its population is under the age of 25, and so has most of their working lives ahead of them. Um, there have been, and there are kind of persistent challenges in, in the area of employment. So how do you think, looking forward, the new government, the incoming government, will seek to address these, perhaps in ways that, um, that they didn't in, in the first term? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how they're going to manage this. I mean, again, it's an interesting sort of trick of the light where it's hard to use a sort of Western model to understand what life is like in India. So if you have, let's say, 10% unemployment in Switzerland, you'd think, well, this is a catastrophe, and you'd have lots of stories about people sitting idle and claiming state benefits and sink estates. And, I mean, India isn't, doesn't really feel like that. You don't actually have much uh, idle unemployment. Um, it's that, you know, this, the sector of people who have formal jobs either blue-collar jobs in factories or white-collar jobs working in a Vodafone store is very tiny. Um, only about 30 million people out of 1.3 billion pay income tax because uh, and that's not... There is some tax avoidance, but that's mostly because only about 30 million people have what you would associate with a middle-class job. And everybody else is either working in agriculture, which is half of the economy, or working in something that's kind of in between, a kind of grey market job. And so... It's not so much that people are unemployed in the sense that they are kind of idle and with nothing to do. It's that they are underemployed, that, that they are, you know, they go to school, they go to some form of higher education, and the, what they want to do is they want to get a kind of blue-collar job that's, or, or even better, a job in the service sector, and they just aren't those kind of jobs. So you end up doing something that's beneath you. 
And what the government can do about that is complicated. So as you say, net job creation under Modi has been pretty close to zero. Um, and so the way that East Asia grew rich, which involved labor-intensive manufacturing in particular, so you moved off the land and into basic factories, and then gradually, once you got into a factory, your productivity increased, and you could kind of move up to different kind of jobs. That's how China became a middle-income economy. It's how almost every other Asian economy managed. It's difficult in India because it has a hopelessly small manufacturing sector. Still, only about 15% of the economy is in, um, is in manufacturing. It's very difficult to open big factories because of all sorts of different um, regulatory problems. And so, I mean, I'm not quite sure what they're going to do about this. I mean, the, the, there are a whole range of policy initiatives that you can take to make it easier to hire and fire people, to make it easier to open factories, to focus on industries that do have a large um, employment potential. And that doesn't necessarily have to be making semiconductor trips. It could be meat processing. It could be tourism. It, there's a whole bunch of, you know, all of the work on this has been done. There's no great secret as to what these industries would be. Um, but making these policy changes is often pretty difficult. So whether they're going to have more luck um, in trying to create the conditions that will allow for mass job creation for these people who are moving off the farms and, and moving very quickly, the 300 million, 400 million people who are going to move from Indian rural areas to towns and cities over the next 10 or 20 years, whether they're going to have more success in the second term than they did in the first, I'm not sure. I mean, that's kind of one of the, the big sort of dilemmas that India is facing. So you mentioned um, that over half of the working population is employed in some form uh, in agriculture. And the run-up to the 2019 election saw a series of very large farmers' marches and protests in Delhi, but also across the country. Um, and these movements uh, focused particularly on questions of indebtedness, uh, which is a cause of much uh, agrarian distress and farmer suicides, um, and also around the issue of agricultural prices. So many of these movements demanded unconditional one-time loan waivers um, for farmers and also higher minimum support prices, which the government has historically offered. Um, the BJP and NDA, though, have been criticized for not necessarily doing enough to address the agrarian crisis, um, which also has other facets uh, around questions of employment, but also in the area of access to and control of land and land acquisitions, um, and access to water, electricity, uh, and so on. Um, so I guess you've you have been based in Mumbai as foreign correspondent, but from there, how do you perceive uh, India's agrarian crisis, which is a crisis that has many dimensions to it, but what are your ways um, of assessing how the NDA has addressed it? Yeah, well, so, I mean, again, it, so the, the size of India's agricultural sector has very important impacts on its democracy since we're, we're, we're sort of focusing on democracy this evening. So unlike in the West uh, or in most advanced democracies, the, you, you, you're used, I mean, almost everyone in this audience is used to a system in which the upper middle classes sort of have lots of voice within the political system, tend to vote more than those at the bottom of the social scale. And in India, that's often exactly reversed. So the richest parts of the country often have the lowest voter turnout, and the highest is either in urban slums or in, um, or in rural areas. And so for good and ill, the farming community has an outsized influence over, over politics. Um, uh, the, the, the representation of India, India's parliament is heavily skewed towards rural areas. And, and so you have this sort of conundrum where farmers are not doing well out of this system, but the political system does respond to them. So as you said, when you have these parts of the country that have... So I was in Mumbai in the state of Maharashtra. The interior of Maharashtra has this sort of basically ongoing drought now. And so although it is one of India's richest and most prosperous and most industrial states, you know, a large portion of the population of the state lives in these kind of areas that are really struggling and are basically sort of perpetually struggling. Um, and the political system responds to that. So, as you say, the, the farmers have demanded the cancellation of loans. They tend to get that at election time. Um, the government tried to... Uh, 
uh, will gave out handouts, um, you know, some thousands of rupees to all farmers as a kind of form of um, direct transfer. You also have minimum, in, minimum price guarantees for crops. The problem is that, I mean, because of the political influence of India's farming sector, and this is going to sound sort of horribly um, kind of market orientated as someone who used to work for the FT, the problem that India's farming sector has is much too big. Um, you know, you cannot have a sort of modernizing economy where more than half of your people work on the land, particularly one in India where there's a sort of structural problem. All the farms are too small. They're not very productive. So it's very hard to move from a, 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 a kind of unproductive, uh, disintegrated agricultural system to one that other um, maturing uh, um, so, so, sort of urbanizing countries have gone through because of the political influence that the farming lobby have, who obviously don't want to do that because they like what they're doing at the moment. And, and so this creates a kind of problem of political economy. It's not an insoluble problem of political economy. The richer states in India tend to have more advanced agricultural sectors than the poorer states, but it means it is difficult for politicians to, to, to sort of help the agricultural sector move in the direction that it needs to go. Now, some of this is going to happen anyway. You know, the, the urbanization is such a powerful pull that the, the, the generation that are born on farms now doesn't want to keep working on farms. They want to leave and go and find better jobs, places where they'll be more productive. But it's difficult for um, to kind of put in place the policies that will help India's agricultural sector uh, develop. So I wonder here if we can come back to... Um crony capitalism. Oh, my favorite subject. Um, because it seems in some sense that the counterpoint to the power wielded by India's farming communities and Indian, the political influence that has uh, to some extent been exerted by Indian farmers uh, has a very kind of strong counterpoint in in crony capitalism and in the alliances between business elites um, and politicians that, um, that you've chronicled. So I'm wondering, can we come back to kind of crony capitalism and think of its place in the broader political landscape? Um, I think there's a sense in which historically, perhaps, especially in the early 2000s, Crony capitalism was associated with uh, the Congress-led UPA, but is this also not a form of capitalism that is malleable, that doesn't necessarily follow party political lines? Um, and to what extent has it or changed shape, or to what extent does it still exert an influence uh, in at the political level. Yeah, so I mean, this was a sort of core thing that I was interested in the book, that the, the, the stage of crony capitalism that India had gone through, but also the stage of crony capitalism that many countries went through. I can't speak to, to Switzerland, which may always have been a perfectly run uh, cantonal democracy, but if you were to look at Britain in the 1820s or America uh, in the 1880s or South Korea in 1965, it's very common for uh, early uh, industrializing economies also to go through a period of rampant uh, a sort of r very rapid wealth creation at the top, so a kind of creation of a, of a sort of form of, of oligarchy in which you have huge amounts of wealth that are siphoned away by the super rich and also rampant crony capitalism. And that, so the, the subtitle of my book was Journeys Through India's New Gilded Age. And so I drew a comparison between the US Gilded Age after the Civil War until the turn of the 20th century and what was going on in India at the moment. And the parallels between these two, although not exact, were were rather interesting. These were both periods in which you had robber baron tycoons who were making huge amounts of money. You had um, lots of corruption scandals that outraged the, the, the kind of early urban upper middle classes. Uh, you had rapid industrialization, a whole range of other parallels as these two societies moved from being predominantly agrarian, the sort of yeoman farmer republic uh, in the American sense, a, a still Gandhian kind of village urban economy in the Indian sense, and they, they were moving very rapidly to be becoming entirely different kinds of industrialized economies. And so what happened, the, the period where my book begins and where this really began in India, India liberalized in, in 1991, but it was really in the middle of the 2000s that, in a sense, India re-globalized with a vengeance. I think we still have this image in our head of India as a 
as a, as a kind of country that is very difficult to do business with, that doesn't trade widely with other economies. And that's actually not really true anymore. In the middle of the 2000s, India opened up very substantially to foreign capital. Uh, this was the period in the run into the Beijing Olympics, the kind of height of um, what some people call hyper-globalization before the financial crisis. And so India had opened up, and, and suddenly you had a huge amount of international investment coming into the country. Uh, you had India's conglomerates beginning to go global. So this was the period in which Tata bought Jaguar Land Rover. There were Indian companies buying coal mines in Australia and Indonesia and mining assets in Africa. All sorts of things were, were going on that had never really happened before. And so one consequence of that, which I detail in the book, is the, the rise of the Indian super rich. There were two billionaires in India in the mid-1990s. Now there are 120 130, depending on who you count. The richest man in Asia is Indian. Um, and on some measure, India has created billionaire wealth more quickly than almost any other large economy in history. M maybe Russia would be the, the most rapid after, its, uh, after the fall of communism. But India has certainly created kind of wealth at its very pinnacle more quickly than China did at a comparable period of its own development. And what came along with that was crony capitalism. Uh, so India had always had, as many countries do, a, a kind of retail corruption problem. So under the old socialist sclerotic system, there's plenty of bribery. You know, you had to pay to bribe a policeman, bribe to get a telephone connection, a bribe to get a scooter. Uh, you probably couldn't get a car. Um, but, but that retail corruption in the middle of the 2000s went wholesale. Um, and suddenly you just had scandal, a uh, multi-billion dollar scandal after multi-billion dollar scandal. And it appeared, as you said, in that period that, that uh, where the Congress was in power, that, I mean, to put it very simply, Mumbai was in charge of Delhi, that, that the tycoons of Mumbai had the politicians of New Delhi in their pocket, that, that in a sense the that these titans of capital were running the country entirely in their own interest, and there was all this sort of squalid back-scratching going on. Uh, as this came to light, it created a huge anti-corruption backlash, and Modi's re-election, Modi's initial election was part of the, the scandal or the reaction to this scandal over corruption. And so, one of again, one of the ways that he was judged was, did he manage to, to put a stop to this? Um, and the answer to that is sort of yes and no. Um, uh, there have been somewhat fewer of these big corruption scandals over the last five years. But still, the, the record on, on corruption is, is a complicated one. There have been a few uh, really big scandals. If you look at surveys of public opinion, Indian voters don't think their country has got any less corrupt. The institutions that you need over the long term to begin to kind of drive corruption out of your system, uh, the courts, the police, the tax authorities, um, have not really increased in, in quality in, in, in any measurable sense. Now, that's not to say that this is a uniquely Indian problem. I mean, as I say, I live in East Asia. All of the successful economies of East Asia were fantastically corrupt at this point in their, their um, economic development. China, you know, spectacularly corrupt for all of its, its growth. Um, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Korea uh, now, and in particular, um, previously. So this isn't as if... It's a kind of unique fault of India's system, although India's system has some particular attributes that encourage corruption. It's that this often happens in the early stages of development. And indeed, there's quite good theoretical literature that corruption can be quite helpful um, in certain types of development, that, that, that it helps to kind of speed the, uh, the, the plow of certain kinds of investment. So uh, uh, has Modi made things better? A little bit. Um, and I think he, in the election campaign, went to great pains to, to try and maintain his image as a clean leader who was the person that people could trust to continue this process of trying to clean up the Indian economy. But his record uh, isn't quite as convincing as he would like to have us believe. And so I'm wondering if we can turn to kind of consider a different proposal, one that you mentioned, um, which was the Congress Party's proposal for a universal basic income, um, which is something that is also being debated in many different parts of the world. Um, now, you mentioned for various reasons during the campaign, this idea never, never really took off um, or was taken all that seriously. But I'm wondering what you see as 
the potential merits and pitfalls um, in a country like India of a universal basic income in addressing perhaps some of the persistent forms of distress and inequality that it faces. Yes, yeah, so it's difficult. I don't, I don't know how many of you in the audience are fans of universal basic income. Um, I wasn't really sure what I thought about this. What I did know was that, in a sense, this was a, a, a kind of solution looking for a problem, that, that it was, it's, uh, uh, you know, people in Silicon Valley enthuse about this uh, as a potential answer to automation. <laughs> Uh, countries that have endemic worklessness in the West uh, look at universal basic income because it might solve that particular problem. If you're on the kind of radical romantic left, then you see it as a good thing because it would allow you to stop having to, uh, you know, sort of engage in wage labor and go off and, you know, flourish in some other way. And in India, it was a completely different set of problems that people were trying to ask. It was par partly agrarian distress, partly the problem of a lack of job creation. And so there's something rather suspicious about a solution which is meant to solve all of these different problems in different contexts, because the odds of it doing that are pretty slim. I suppose I saw the debate about a universal basic income as a very positive thing, and, and the fact that the Congress Party were making it, as I said, a lot of people took as a symbol of the Congress Party's intellectual renewal. I mean, at least this party, which when it was ejected from power in 2014, appeared to be a kind of racket, um, was going through a process of trying to think about interesting ideas, and, and think about interesting ideas that were sort of egalitarian and that we're trying to solve real problems out there in the world. I think the practical proposal that the Congress came up to, came up with, had a lot of, lot of problems with it. The most obvious being that in order to fund it, there's a political economy problem. So in order to fund this, the idea was you were going to give every uh, poor family um, 72,000 rupees, uh, which is a kind of reasonably chunky amount for a country that poor, and in order to fund that, you were going to have to close down other targeted welfare proposals. And the idea that this could ever happen in practice in India is just completely balmy. The, the notion that, that you, know, you have popular uh, uh, targeted programs, payments to, uh, payments to farmers, payments to women, free cooking gas, the idea that you were, uh, your minimum support prices for farmers, the notion that you could just take all of these away and sort of bundle them up into some kind of universal basic income. I mean, I just cannot conceive of a way that that could possibly happen, given the, the politics of that. Um, and, and so that wasn't the reason why the proposal didn't end up being politically popular, which was different. But the, 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 whether it would have been a good idea in practice, the, I think lots of people looked at it and said, this is just practically infeasible in India, because you could never actually get a consensus that would agree with that. And so... It's sort of that that was really where it was left, that, that in the end there was a dilemma with these. The more universal you made these, the more impractical it became to deliver, and the more targeted you made it, then the more it was just like another kind of cash handout that, that was what the BJP in the end did for farmers. They had a kind of small cash handout for farmers, but that's not the same as a universal basic income. So, um, so that, that was kind of the dilemma, and I think that's where the dilemma rests now, because it clearly wasn't... Um, anywhere near enough to, to do what the Congress hoped it was going to do. So clearly in India is distinctive uh, in many respects, but I think um, many observers of India and indeed of democratic politics around the world um, have drawn comparisons between phenomena that we see in India, uh, the rise of nationalism, populism, and so, in, and so on. Um, and obviously, we see echoes um, of, this, of this globally. Uh, and so I'm wondering if we think kind of now more globally um, and broadly, what kinds of patterns and dynamics do you see in India and that have surfaced through, through the election and over the last five years um, that resonate globally? And in which ways does, does the country, are some of these dynamics explained by underlying um, patterns that, that are distinctive to the country itself? In what ways is it different? So, I mean, if you're an Indian liberal at the, at the moment, the sort of rare and decreasing species, then Modi's election is, is viewed as a kind of cataclysm. Uh, there's an awful lot of depression amongst, you know, if you're a sort of young Indian student or you live in, in downtown Mumbai or, or central Delhi, and people, think, people fear 
with some some reasonable reason that, that that the kind of India may be on the cusp of the sort of thing that happened to Turkey. So um, the parallel is often made between Erdogan in his early days when Erdogan began life as a as a sort of market friendly reformer that you know who was kind of favoured by the West. He had a, a, a sort of link to a certain religious constituency, but he appeared to be the kind of person who was going to come and reform Turkey's economy. And then gradually, the longer he stayed in power, the more autocratic he became, the more extreme uh, his uh, um, sort of communal identity became, and the more power he took into his own hands. And so people look at Modi and say, okay, so he might have started out with this reputation uh, internationally as a, as a sort of moderate technocrat, but actually maybe he's going to gradually... Um, in a sense, ditch this idea of, of economic uh, reform and, and run on a more cultural agenda so that the idea of his more extreme supporters that India is no longer a, um, a kind of constitutional republic uh, with um, secular tolerance written into its constitution, but that it is a country that has a majority Hindu population um, and the constitution should reflect that um, predominant position of Hindus. Um, I don't think that is very likely to happen. I mean, I think for kind of very practical reasons to do with how difficult it is to make major changes in the Indian political system, it would be very difficult for Modi to do that, uh, even if he wanted to. And I have to say, you know, the, to give the man credit, I, 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 my guess is that he is going to return uh, after the election to more of a focus on economic reform. I mean, I think you have to see, for those of you, I know you can see some of you are from India and know this better than I do, but you have to sort of think about Modi and his electoral coalition a little bit like you think about the American Republicans. So you have, or the American Republicans before Trump, um, uh, in which you had this coalition of the kind of business-friendly East Coast uh, financial elite with Southern conservative religious types and, and that's very similar to what you see in in the BJP that you have a kind of union of a sort of mercantile class of, of shopkeepers and money managers with a conservative Hindi uh, speaking uh, Hindu religious heartland and, and I suppose that this is the big question for his second term is he going to try and having won a second term will he suddenly reveal himself to be a kind of religious fanatic, as he was in his early days when when he uh, left home and and was a kind of traveling preacher, religious organizer for a, an extreme uh, uh, Hindu organization called the RSS. And, and in a sense, will they begin to prosecute more aggressively? various totemic policies that the BJP has always wanted to do, the rebuilding of temples, um, changing India's constitution and its laws to either reflect uh, the dominance of Hinduism or to, to sort of get rid of special exceptions for Muslims or all sorts of things that, that the more extreme of his supporters want to do, or will he pivot back to, to the economy? Um, and my suspicion is that it's hard to tell. We don't know which way this is going to go. Um, that, that what you will see is a kind of continuation of what happened in, in his first term, which is what you were asking about, where you have seen a kind of gradual emboldening of, of this uh, kind of extreme Hindu nationalist constituency. Um, but that hasn't had as yet substantial uh, kind of legislative or constitutional effect. The way it has been felt has been in kind of cultural campaigns that have made minorities feel very insecure. So that might be, uh, just, this was a policy change, but changes in whether or not you, the, you're, the treatment of cows and, and vigilantism amongst uh, uh, people who wanted to protect the, the, the holy status or the, relig the kind of sacred status of cows, uh, campaigns about uh, interfaith marriage, um, again, not really prosecuted by the government, pushed by extreme religious organizations, but not really stopped by the government either. And I think you're likely to see more of that. The, the question is really whether the government begins to kind of lead this charge or whether it simply s s sort of doesn't stop it. Um, and I think that will be the, the dynamic to watch. So before we uh, open up for audience questions, I have one last question um, on exactly this point and kind of coming back to your book um, in which you in the introduction identify a kind of crossroads 
um, and you write, and I'm quoting, will India's Gilded Age blossom into a progressive era of its own in which the perils of inequality and crony capitalism are left decisively behind? Or will the excesses of the last decade gradually reemerge, presaging a future scarred by, by graft and deformed by inequality? India's ambition to lead the second half of the Asian century and the world's hope for a more democratic liberal future depends on getting this right. So with the 2019 election concluded, um, I have two related questions. First of all, would you still characterize the crossroads in this way? Do the crossroads still look the same? Um, and in which direction, whichever the crossroads are now, um, in which direction do you see India moving in, in the years to come? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it depends on which way you look at it. So if you're sitting in sort of central Delhi and you have the kind of values that I'm guessing many people in this audience have, there's a tendency to see what's going on in India as, as, as a kind of big step in the wrong direction. This is how people view Modi um, if you're part of the kind of urban upper middle class often. Um, uh, uh, however, looked at from a global perspective, um, actually India isn't moving as badly in the wrong direction as many other places are. Um, and so when I was touring the book and trying to talk to people in the US about this, I was trying to convince people that they should care about India's direction more than they, they do, um, in part because we all have a huge stake in the success of India's democratic experiment, particularly at a time when other major world powers particularly China, um, you know, which is kind of descending into a, uh, a neo-Leninist autocracy and where the, the hope for some kind of transition to that sort of Singaporean style uh, of order appears to be receding, but also Russia, also Turkey, also, you know, all these other places that you alluded to in your question. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, I think this um, kind of... These two paths remain open... Uh, for India. When I was writing that, I was thinking in particular of this issue of crony capitalism, and there was a period in the mid-2000s where it really did um, uh, appear not so much that India was going to become a, 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 a kind of more uh, religiously divided country, but that it was going to become a more oligarchic country, more like Russia, um, in, in which the, the kind of the big tycoons were taking over the political system uh, and that there was a risk uh, that that became a kind of entrenched model, not just that you had widening levels of social inequality, which is a theme that I talk about in the book where India has become a much less unequal, much less equal country over the last couple of decades. Uh, it now has very high levels uh, of inequality, much higher than it used to have, even though most people have in their head the idea that India is a, an unequal country anyway. Um, but also you, you would had this kind of entrenched uh, um, power of a very small number of business leaders. Now that future, I think, has got slightly less likely over the last decade. The, the tycoon class, although they're by no means in, in full retreat, have struggled uh, partly because of their own excesses during the boom years of the mid-2000s and partly because of some of the changes that, that Modi introduced. But in terms of the, the wider themes that I talk about in the book, India still has widening levels of inequality and it is as yet struggling to find ways of addressing that, and that is problematic for reasons that, that we can talk about if you like. And as I said, um, it, there has not been a, a decisive break with the kind of culture of corruption and crony capitalism. However, I mean, I end my book on a kind of optimistic note, and I claim in the book that it is a kind of a, a, has an optimistic outlook, and, and that is not particularly because of what's happening in India, where you can see all sorts of problems everywhere. And, and when the book was reviewed in the New York Times, the New York Times reviewer said, you know, Mr. Crabtree claims this is an optimistic book, but if you read it, there's not very much to be optimistic about. Um, and that may be true, um, but I go back to the kind of historical analogy that if you look, if you were to go and look at America in the 1880s, you would see a country that uh, was being kind of torn apart by wealth and inequality and corruption, where there was a, they were called the millionaire class at that point, but the millionaire class were perceived to be completely amoral. Um, uh, kind of extracting wealth 
um, entirely for themselves, no sense of social responsibility. Every uh, uh, city government, Chicago, New York, was seen to be rampantly corrupt, all sorts of scandals. And yet, over the next 20, 30, 40 year period, you had a range of progressive political reforms, some of which were to do with the emergence of a larger urban middle class that had different values and demanded different things from its politics, some of which were to do with elite reforms, so trust busting, the, the, the kind of breaking up of very powerful entrenched uh, forms of capital. Uh, after that, you had the creation of the beginnings of a welfare state of sorts that, that found its ultimate form in the reaction of the New Deal. And so even from a position um, in which uh, an early industrializing economy appears to have all of these problems, over a sort of 20, 30 year period, if you introduce these kind of progressive political reforms, it can make a huge difference. And that has been true in many Asian countries that have grown um, either to middle income status or grown rich prior to India. And I see no particular reason why it can't happen in India's case. It isn't going to happen by accident, um, but there's no reason at all for, for fatalism about the, the kind of country's path and its prospects. In fact, it should be easier for India to do this because it's coming last and therefore it can kind of learn from those countries that have gone before it. So, I mean, I, I ended the book on that note of optimism and I, I see no particular reason why India and its political system cannot make uh, the, the, those same positive choices. And indeed, as a final point, I mean, in India's political system, we, both in India and amongst observers of India, there's a sort of tendency to see India's democracy as a great disadvantage because under a democratic system, it's very difficult to build bullet trains and roads are slow and political change is difficult. But there's also a kind of, um, in the phrase of Nicholas Taleb, there's a, there's a sort of anti-fragility in the Indian system. And so if you were to take a bet, I often sort of try and get people to take this bet. If you were to, to take your, your, your Swiss franc or your euro and you were to bet which of India or China is going to have the same political system in 2050, then, I mean, I would take the bet that India will have the same political system. It's perfectly plausible to imagine that India could become a prosperous, middle-income, parliamentary democracy with exactly the same political system that it has now. It's much harder to imagine that China is going to become a rich economy over the next 20 or 30 years and have the same political system that it does at the moment. It might do, but it would be historically unprecedented for a country with that kind of political system, with that level of repression, to be able to create an advanced a uh, rich world economy you know, at the technological frontier. And, and so there are strengths in India's political system, both in terms of holding together a very diverse country, uh, but also um, in terms of the, you know, the experience of what kinds of political systems tend to help countries become wealthy. And, and so I don't think India should be too uh, uh, a sort of, uh, shouldn't problematize excessively um, its own system of governance, which has its problems, but in the long term has much to recommend it. So, Great. Thank you very much, James.